Hi everyone, this is Bree Luna from Reading Rev, and today we're going to talk about a better way or a new way to teach heart words, tricky words, irregular words, red words, whatever you happen to call them. So just a, a brief history, we began teaching red words with our Orton Gillingham program um, years ago, and we really did it as rote memorization. So kids would um, understand that it was a red word, that it was not phonetically secure, and we had a red word routine. And that routine often was just memorizing and repeating the letters in a word. So if the word was said, we would say S-A-I-D, said, S-A-I-D, said. And we did some tactile things with the red crayons and the red screens. We did identify the irregular part. Um, but we also were just teaching random words. So if you look on that um, video, the first one, the red words that we were working on that week were most and once, which are not connected in any way and also were not connected to the phonics or the phonetic pattern that we were working on that week. And I um, really saw that for some kids this method worked, but for my struggling readers or my dyslexic students, it was um, it was not happening. It was not working for them. And the bottom picture is actually a group of fifth graders that um, second semester of fifth grade, we were like, we have got to get these kids to know how to spell these common high frequency irregular words before we send them off to middle school. We did this entire ultimate red word challenge. They got to run over a stopwatch with my car. It was a whole thing. And in the end, it was successful, but it took so much time and commitment. So we're then two years ago in 2022, um, did a bunch of research and realized we have got to think differently about red words. It can't be rote memorization of random words because we're not doing that anymore. And so we did some digging and we realized that we really should be talking about the etymology of these words and we should be making some connection and can still map the words and understand that it's not um, just letters that we need to memorize, that most of these red words are phonetically secure and play fair. We can just identify the heart part and tune into that. So we started a collaboration with a whole lot of teachers and we created a Google slide deck and um, put the red words in there and then had people from our professional development and um, teachers in our community um, do some research about the etymology and finding some patterns. And two years later, that project is finally done. So today we're gonna dig in and give you a brief overview of that, um, of that project. So first of all, I wanna start with saying, um, we want to have a scope and sequence always, always, always. And that is gonna look a little different for emergent readers than what this project is. So for emergent readers, we really want to have a scope and sequence that aligns with their decodables. It typically, we need to teach high frequency words like the, have, said, of. And oftentimes we can have words that we want them to know like he and she, but before we've taught that phonetic pattern and they, those become temporary heart words. So if you are a teacher in kindergarten and first grade, you're probably gonna want to continue doing that and not throw all of what we're up to now with etymology at your emergent readers, it's too much. So keep it simple, teach them just what they need to know to be successful with the decodables and focus, your primary focus is on, um, on your phonics patterns. This project is going to be for um, second grade and beyond, and it really is more of a word study program where it really gives them the full picture of English is not that crazy. We can, we can um, figure out a lot and make a lot of connections and patterns by um, knowing more about language. So we want to then align our red word study or our irregular word study with our phonics sequence. We want to show them um, the pattern that it's breaking and why it's breaking it. We also want to um, give them the, the history, the stories, and, and students often love this part. And we want to give them as many examples as we can. So let's dive into that. The first one, um, 
the first thing that we did is we connected to our phonics and morphology. So here are some examples of that. If we look at the word guy, guest, guest, and guard, it makes no sense why we have that extra U there, right? And it feels irregular, and we would just say that's the heart part, and you have to memorize it. But if you dig a little bit deeper, what we really know is happening is that that U is there to keep the G hard. If it wasn't, if the U wasn't there, the next letter is going to make that G, um, that it's gonna make that G soft, right? So that would say Jai, Jess, and Jess. And so we have that U there because we know that in those, in that hard and soft G pattern, um, a G followed by a U makes its hard sound G. And so then it is interesting that guard is actually follows that pattern, even though it does have an A, and it is just to um, simplify spelling. So at one point in our history during Middle English, we um, came to the understanding we've got to have some, some spelling patterns and rules. And so that was literally just changed to, to jump off the cliff with the rest of them. Same thing for said. When I teach this with the AI, it doesn't really make a lot of sense when we teach it um, prior to kids knowing that AI spells long A, right? So yes, we need to teach said in kindergarten and first grade because it's very frequent, but they don't really understand why it's a rule breaker until we get to the AI vowel team. And at that point, then I teach students that we actually in, British English and Old Eng uh, Middle English, we actually pronounced that as said. So it would make perfect sense that it's spelled that way because that was actually the pronunciation as well. And so we can put our pinkies up and pretend like we're in, um, in England and say, I said, and again, and students will anchor onto that story and that, um, that silly, um, muscle memory that they have, right? That silly experience. And remember that they are spelled AI. We also want to connect it to morphology as often as we can. So these three words, else, false, and dense, the E is there, it's one of the jobs of E to make sure that it doesn't look like a plural. So we add S at the end of many words to look plural. So would that follow that last word be dens? Like I have more than one den or is it dense? And so connecting it to um, the phonics and the morphology patterns that you're teaching is going to, to be more powerful and they're gonna learn a lot more than if we're just randomly memorizing irregular words. This I touched a little bit on the last slide, but etymologies and stories are powerful. And oftentimes our dyslexic learners, our 15 to 20% um, are really, um, really amazing people people <laughs> they are um, they connect to stories they connect to history they learn well by understanding um, what what the connections of people are and so for those students if you tell them about the scribes in um, in history before we had the printing press and every book had to be handwritten and the scribes were writing in old cursive that was very loopy and very um, lots of round letters and lots of tall round round letters. And when they were going to spell U with other loopy letters like M's and, and N's and V's, then it would all run together and just look like a bunch of squiggles. And so they actually changed the U to an O in order for it to be more legible or more readable. And so um, showing what that old English um, cursive looks like, showing them how many of these words are scribal O's. It sounds like a short U, but it's spelled with an O, but there's a reason. And students really actually love learning this history and bringing it to life rather than memorizing random letters. We don't want to teach one word at a time. And, and the recommendation is, you know, teach two or three heart words at a time. And that is true if you're doing disconnected random words. But if I'm teaching a pattern, then look at how many words follow that pattern. So I can show them lots and lots of words. No English word ends in the letter V. 
and look how many words I can show that that placeholder E, that's one of the jobs of E, is there so that the V is not the last letter. And it would be silly for me to teach just one or two of those randomly at a time when I could teach seven or eight or nine or 10 and just show them the pattern rather than the word. So the how of this is I am just incorporating this into my word study. I'm, I'm incorporating this into my word level instruction. So I'm going to have my phonics pattern of the week. I'm going to have my morphology pattern of the week. And I'm simply just integrating this into that structure or my system. And it might look like I introduce the phonics pattern on Monday. On Tuesday, I introduce the red word or the heart word pattern. It is, um, we talk about the etymology, why it is that way. And then throughout the week, they have several opportunities to just revisit and practice that. Um, lots of us, myself included, did not know much, if anything, about etymology. And the more I learned, it's insane to me how much um, how much this makes sense that if you learn just the most basic part, we're not we're not diving deep into this at all, but just the general idea of etymology um, helps you crack the code of so many words. And so the old adage that English is crazy and cannot be explained and it's the most complicated language and that is actually a complete myth. And we we actually have only about 4% of English words that are truly irregular. The rest of them can be explained by knowing the phonics pattern, by knowing morphology, and by knowing etymology. So I hope that this helps, and I would love to hear your thoughts.